Hey guys, this is Faster U4 brought to you by Fitland, Tailwind Nutrition, Biomax, and Capital Cycles. If you're a cyclist, you want to go faster? Then it is giddy up. Nice. Well, great to Fast U4 brought to you by Fitland, Tailwind Nutrition, Biomax, and Capital Cycles. So, a quick one today. A little um, <clears throat> update on some product related stuff. It's kind of um, kind of some version of stuff uh, stuff I've bought that I know works really well. I've bought crap in the past bike related products that are rubbish and I've bought stuff that's good. Let's see. Um, <clears throat> I think sometimes you know you buy kit the low anytime you buy a low end kit that's rubbish. Anytime you buy a non bad quality shoes, that's rubbish. Anytime you buy a helmet because it's cheap and um, kind of doesn't fit you quite right, that's a bad move. So I'm, I'm here to say a couple of things I bought lately that work really well. That notion is that I can maybe save you some time and some money and show you some of the, the cool features. So um, <clears throat> see, let me show you here. Maybe I can do my downloads here. Now this is a picture of, if you're looking at the screen, uh, one thing I've got lately that works well. This is a Chapter 2 Riri bicycle. Now I'm sorry about in the picture, I don't have my sexy race wheels on. I've got my training wheels on there. It's a picture out by Eastbourne. And um, this is the new, very new, like came out last month, May 2018, bike from Chapter 2. So there's two bikes that Chapter 2 make, the Tiri and the Riri. The Tiri is the lightweight climbing version, the all-rounder. I've got the Riri. The Riri is the aero version. You can kind of see some of the little aero features that I'll describe a little bit more, which are around the junction with the uh, seat stay and the, the um, head, head tube and stuff. And the down tube as well, you can't really see in this picture, but it's a very narrow kind of aero design. Some of the initial um, discussion was, I was originally going to look at getting the Cavelo S5, which is sort of the gold standard for aero road race bikes, but it was, you know, 11 grand or more for a sort of Ultegra or Giro race equipped bike, and that was too much for me. So I was looking for something a little bit of value. The Cavelo is good. These ones had just come out, the Chapter 2, so I was willing to give it a try. And, um, so I just had this built up by my friends at Capital Cycles, who did a lovely build. So I've got the Chapter 2 Riri frame set in the black and green colorway with the, and I went ahead and spec'd it out with the integrated bar system as well from Chapter 2, which is called a mana. But mana means pride, Riri means flow. So. Uh, I'll give you a few impressions for riding it after riding it for a week or so and uh, I'd also point you towards uh, Cycling Porn on Facebook who just published a review today on it pretty much identical bike and um, I, the reason I'd say that is because the kind of the sentiments in it were exactly uh, my impressions as well, really. And they also published something which I couldn't really find, which was the actual drag and your data on the bike from the Auckland University wind tunnel. So if you go ahead and look at the, the drag of a bicycle or bicycle component, wheel or frame set, you really want to measure that over a variety of your angles, your 
the direction, the angle at which the wind is effectively hitting the bike to account for a lot of wind conditions. So they, they did that in the wind tunnel with this bike and it has the full range of your, as you know, if you go to Suckling Porn, try not to um, misspell that one in your browser, that you'll get the uh, gist of what I'm talking about with the idea that, so, so the idea of checking about yours is that, you, of course, you know, a bike that's very aerodynamic at one your angle may not be at another and so on. So you want the, the best mix or you can get really anal. You know, people who, some, some components and bikes and setups are designed in such a way that they're really ideal in a relatively low range of your angles. And the best example is this is setups for the Kona Ironman, which always have the same wind conditions and it's very important to get right. There's certain wheel sets and frame sets that are really market on the basis that they are very good. And those, that, that low range of your angles, which is pretty interesting, and um, if you, you know, you can imagine there's a big North American market that probably targets that race, and that's why. But for the Riri, I like the fact that it's stable in a lot of your angles and slippery, because that's more like the conditions where I ride in. Wellington and New Zealand where there can be gusty winds from all angles it's not and, and it can be quite you know important because we do have a lot of wind so having something that's stable for one and a range of your angles and efficient in a range of your angles was important for me and uh, I also said to the guys at Capitals when I was looking at bikes I wanted something that would be good for long range breakaways or, you know, I'm a time trialist type of rider. And I, sometimes it can be a big advantage when you are in a way in a breakaway <clears throat> to be able to make a little bit of extra time because of the aero of your bike. Just to put it in perspective, the difference between a full aero bike frame set like this and a regular one, most people seem to agree somewhere in the range of five seconds per kilometer at 40 kilometers an hour and um, so you know if you are on a potentially you know a 50 kilometer breakaway <clears throat> I'll take what is it 50 times five seconds give or take you know minutes and minutes and so if you just say let's let's be super conservative and say it's half of that two and a half seconds per kilometer that's two minutes on a 50 kilometer breakaway Two minutes on a 50 kilometer breakaway, that's 40 kilometers an hour, that's probably a bit, about what, a kilometer and a half? That could easily, and in fact has for me, that exact scenario played out in the Tour of Taranaki last year, where I've, oh, you know, actually twice, twice in the last year that exact scenario has played out. Once Tour of Taranaki stage three or four or something, and once North Island Team Series Race 3, both caught within a kilometre of the line on breakaways that were actually even longer than that. So all I'm saying is, these things kind of sound a bit anal on paper, but if you kind of extrapolate it to real world, yeah, it's entirely possible that that could make a difference for you in your results. That's all I'm saying. So that's why I've chosen the Riri based on those things. I think it also really looks cool. And so, so that's the sort of overview as far as riding goes. I've ridden it three or four times now. A range of hills and flats and stuff. Look, and, and here's the long and short of it. It kind of is one thing that people must be a lot more sensitive than me, or they're lying. Because you have a lot of this thing where people get a bike and they say, oh yeah, it's so stiff, or it's so flexy, or it's so this, or so that. To be honest, I've, I've never really found that. I don't put out a lot of watts in a sprint, so maybe that's why. But I don't notice between one decent-ish bike and another, I don't notice any of that. It's bullshit. I don't. I don't think it's true. Um, I don't think. And even if it is somehow measurably true, you know, in a scientific sense, I, I've never actually sort of felt in any real-world subjective sense that somehow slowing you down or making a difference. 
and it may be different if you're, different if you're comparing high quality bikes to mid or low range quality bikes, but uh, I think most of the time it's correct. So what's the point then? Well, okay, so there's the, the aero part, and there's the, um, the ride itself, not really any different. So I'm comparing two, two bikes really. One is my training bike, which is a knockoff of a, which is a carbon Chinese Hongfu, and it's, it's like a knockoff, it's like a knockoff, really, it's funnily enough, it's kind of almost like a knockoff of something like a Riri, an aero road bike. And I'm also comparing to a Cannondale Super 6 Evo, which has been my race bike for the last couple of years. Ride quality, eh, I don't think there is any. There might be some measurable ride quality difference. I don't notice any, there you go. One thing I will say, um, the integrated bar and steel does feel quite stiff. Again, whether that's something that's good or bad, I don't know. But I, like the, I do like the feeling of it in a sprint, I will say that. It's not really the frame set, it's really just the bar. And you know, you've got this massive chunk of monocoque, you can kind of understand why that would feel stiff. <laughs> so, but upright, climbing, all that, it's, I don't think there's any difference. I don't, I, there may be a difference, but it's not, it's not, you don't jump on a different bike, assuming that it's set up much the same and feel a difference. Okay, well, here's what I do, and it's kind of where I hoped it would, and I'm sure this isn't some sort of like cognitive bias on my part, which is when you get down in the drops, and this bike is designed for this long range breakaway in the drops, and my God, it does feel really good. Uh, what does that mean? Uh, one thing, the bar shape's actually nice. So again, that's a bar thing. It bar, they seem to hold your hands, you, like you're not slipping backwards or forwards, it's kind of holding this nice neutral position. The bend is good. Um, the, the, maybe, maybe it's the angle of the seat tube or something for me. feels very comfortable and natural, like, like as if I'm not, um, there's no... How do I put it? <laughs> like as if you're not putting any extra energy into any extra sway or movement or weirdness. And I realize a lot of that sort of bike set up in that, but it's exactly the same as my Cannondale. It feels better. Maybe that is stiffness. There you go. Okay, here's the biggie. The main difference is on the front end. Um, the front end has what has become... So data's sort of proven over the last couple of years, and this is kind of made famous by Bradley Wiggins in his hour record, that you get these forks now, and the, the trend is towards uh, bowing the fork legs out a little bit at the front. And the idea is that the airflow between the wheel and the fork interface is more efficient doing that. You'll see that on a bike like the Pinarello Bolide or something. And so the photo I'm showing of the bike doesn't really show that because it's not from front on, but if you just go and Google it, you'll see what I'm talking about. And it's not much, but it, wow, man, it, it feels, weirdly, not any more stable or anything. Quite responsive, so the steering response is actually feels nice. And I think it's partly due to how the, either the, the leg, fork leg, um, like manufacture process or something, uh, the carbon layout, maybe, I don't know. But in this look, this sounds insane, but I'm just going to say what I think. When you are down in the drops and you're powering along, it's like you can feel less drag, Euro drag on the front end. Now, that sounds insane because how can you, how am I supposed to determine if the, I mean, maybe you can feel if the bike's draggier. How are you going to know where it comes from? Um, I think it's just a little bit to do with how it reacts and the wind and all that. And to be honest, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to back that up because anyone's ridden a bike for a while does kind of feel like you can feel if the frame's a little more compliant in the area. And this is more, more aero efficient. I mean, it should be. That's why it's designed that way. I get all that. And it's entirely possible that I'm imagining it because of that. Having said that, steering response is good, almost verging on twitchy actually, 
but it feels like it's slicing through the ear better. That's what I think. Um, I do notice, I mean, you should notice for five seconds per kilometer, some form of, you know, real world speed increase. And it, it, apart from getting on an indoor velodrome and really being exact, there's no way to, to quantify that, particularly on the road, but I'm super familiar now in, in a range of wind conditions, ideally still wind conditions, on the roads I ride on all the time, power and speeds. And this is one or two kilometers an hour faster because of that. And actually, again, it sounds like a wildly subjective thing to say, and maybe it is, but I'm not the only one to report it. Look, all I'm saying is it feels faster, it should be faster. So I'm happy with that. Is it? You know, and I think maybe my subjective feelings kind of line up with what you would expect from that wind tunnel data and what we know about the shaping of tubes. So that's all I'd say about that. I don't know that there needs to be this discussion of, you know, varieties of carbon and uh, designs and stuff because yeah, people, people overplay that. Yeah, as long as it's comfortable, it's set up right for you. Yeah, it's reasonably light, it's reasonably efficient, that's all you want. Um, so as far as weight, whole thing, bottle cages, Dura-Ace pedals, I've got a Quark D4 crank set on here, Zip 404s, I think it's 7.5 kilos. So it's not super light. It's not super heavy either, it's just kind of what you'd expect. Um, because I'm anal, I like to kit out my bikes with titanium and aluminium bulk kits and stuff, but they won't really take take it down much. Um, I guess one thing to know about the bike is it does have um, dual pivot brakes. If you don't know what that is, it's kind of like the more modern standard for brakes. So like you have kind of mountain bike style, you have a brake pivot on each fork, leg and chain or seat stay. So it bolts in two places. Instead of the traditional road bike caliper design, which is bolted in the middle. And um, supposedly that's supposed to save weight, make the brakes better. I don't notice any of that. Um, but they do look quite cool. So I'll say, man, you know, I kind of want to get past this thing where I feel like, you know, in the last, it's like anything, you know, I feel like bikes went through this great evolution with things like STI shifting and clipless pedals. And those are genuinely big deals. So when we start talking about carbon fiber layup and a couple of angles here and there, uh, I'm just not convinced that it really makes a hell of a lot of difference. For me, it's all about the aero on this bike. No, it's almost identical weight to my Cannondale Super 6. Um, it's like literally somewhere within 50 or 100 grams or something. And um, your yeah, one thing, uh, one, one more thing I've said is that on this um, you do have to use for your Garmin mount at the front. It's kind of got a, like a, your bolts on underneath. It's just like a little teaspoon shape. Uh, what I got was a K edge something. K, K edge, I can't what it's called. Just like K edge, uh, you know, integrated bar Garmin mount. That's what you want. Seems to be like the best one. Um, mm -hmm. So. My wildly unscientific description of the new Chapter 2 Riri. I really like it, I'm really happy with it. Um, cost only comes as a frame set, frame set for uh, seat posts. It's about three and a half grand, which is you know good value for a bike like this. I'm, I'm certainly happy with it. Um, you could quite happily put a nice group set on this. Be away laughing. Power meter wise, people ask all the time. I just did what I always do, which is decide what works. For me, that is a quark. And I can't quite figure it out. The quark, they make this as complicated as possible. There's a number of different chassis. This one has D4 instead of D0 written on it. And I think that's just kind of like the chassis, the power meter bit is all the same. Just the look of it and how it bolts on. Uh, 
to the spider and stuff and how it looks is different, but the actual guts of it is the same. So that's what I did. I said, I said, what do you want for the crankshaft? I said, one of those. Got one of those. It works great. They just work. Um, I was actually emailing one of my clients the other day who was asking about power meters. And, you know, now that there's all these problems known with just about every pedal-based system, by the way, if you want to persevere with that, they still work fine, but there will be some persevering with battery caps and stuff. Yeah, that's kind of a pain. Uh, there is, you know, lots of known problems with all-cost problems, like Isarium. It's a great unit, but no one buys them anymore because they're too expensive. There's lots of new, untried versions of uh, pedal spindle based ones coming out, but the question was like what to get sort of now that's tried and true if you've got money or it's your job to ride a bike go for the quack, it's climbing just works uh, if you want a cheaper option that is super awesome and bomb proof look at a power tap hub, I mean I've got one it's probably 10 years old it is truck and you cannot kill it it is super accurate it just well it just just works the battery life is great you're getting months out of it it's easy it's, uh, it's relatively easy to replace the battery uh, i mean it has all that and i mean if you can pick up a wheel set not just the hub built into a alloy training wheel set which is probably just a fine wheel set as it is for like, I found one on the other day, 750 bucks. Something like that, which is insane value. Um, that's what I'd get <laughs> if, if I was kind of wanting a, you know, a cheaper option. The downside is that it doesn't have left-right power because it's measuring at the hub. It does have a little bit of a factor that the power it's producing or showing you is always consistent, but it's just minus drivetrain drag, somewhere between two and three percent and of course it's in a wheel so you don't get to change wheels for races but if none of those things are a major issue for you that is insane value for something that just works that's what I get so there is that so the other kind of little techy thing um, that is kind of important this time of year and a lot of people ask me about is indoor trainers and um, this is what I'm on now. Someone said the other day, it sounds like I'm a heavy breather on the phone because, by the way, young people, you probably won't get this, but back in the day, it used to be kind of like a game that, I don't know, serial pedophiles would play. They would phone up random houses and breathe deeply when the person picked up the phone. I don't quite know what that was supposed to do. In hindsight, I'm not really sure what, what the purpose of that was, what it did. It's not particularly scary because it could just be your granddad who's having a heart attack and desperately trying to get you to phone an ambulance but can't, can't breathe. Or it could alternatively be a serial stalker pedophile, but they don't really know where you live. It's just your phone number. So I don't really get why that was a thing, but it was sort of in the popular culture for a while. I may have even got one of those calls once, but you know it was always the same because it was always some kid who'd heard the story and wanted to like you know, give you a fright, so, knew your phone number, so we'd call you and, you know, breathe menacingly into the phone, again, for what end, I'm not really clear, but anyway, on, uh, on other related matters, or non-related matters, the, uh, the techie thing, I don't know how I got onto that, but, is the, uh, is the smart trainer, indoor trainer, here's what you want, people say, what should I get, here's what you're going to do, Okay, kind of like the days of the regular magnetic or fluid trainer are kind of behind us. If you have, if you want to buy a new trainer, here's what you're going to do. You're going to buy a smart trainer. Smart trainer means that it can interact via Bluetooth with an app. And that's good because it means you can control the resistance of the trainer automatically. Now there's tons of features, there's tons of trainers. You can go to DC Rainmaker, you can look at all the reviews. The one I've got is kind of like the Daddy Trainer, because I spent a lot of time on it. The Daddy Trainer is the Tax Neo, T-A-C-X, 
NEO Tax Neo. The reason it's the daddy is because it has all of the awesome features and costs a lot of cash. Somewhere like around two, two and a half grand. So that's a lot and I get it, but this time of year, you can end up spending a lot of time inside. Having a good smart trainer can make it easier. Okay, so what am I talking about? These features, if you don't know, I'll explain a couple and that'll give you a hint as to, as to the bits that matter. So the bits that matter are two. Well, it's really one, it's the, it's the bit I mentioned before. You can go into the tax software, you can create a workout, and I do this for my clients all the time, those who have smart trainers, you can mirror the exact workout that you're gonna supposed to be doing for your 100% quality writing as a workout in the software. So, for example, if I want you to do a warm up for five minutes at 150 watts, I set it, you get on pedal for five minutes, you're doing 150 watts. You can pedal faster, you can pedal slower. The trainer senses that, adjusts the resistance or the torque part accordingly, and we'll just back off or add resistance to make it always, you guessed it, 150 watts. Next part of the workout, I want you to be sitting there between your lactate one and two, your optimal aerobic zone, I'm going to tweak it to 75% of that actually, that's going to be 220 watts and I want you to sit those 10 minutes and I want you to uh, do three little bursts at the end of that for warm up. I can program that but you can pedal 100 RPM, you can pedal 90 RPM. The trainer will keep you at 220 watts, exactly where you want to be. The next part is an interval, I want you to be bang on your lactate threshold where your legs start to burn like a hill climb, 90 RPM for five minutes. You're gonna target that maximum steady state power. You guessed it, the trainer resistance just goes up to the exact level and holds you there. In Sunny Gym, you can pedal faster, you can pedal slower, but the total power will remain the same, dictated by training software and the trainer. So. My point is this, if you ever go and look at this erg mode type of workout and someone's workout they've done with Strava or something, and you see it all looks like these really nice, semi, almost like straight lines, like their heart rate and their power, looks like it's, looks like it's just, it's just perfect. It's the perfect quality workout. Well, that, that's because they're using a smart trainer on this mode. And someone like me has gone and programmed it for them. Uh, so that's the benefit, is training quality. One hour of workout on a smart trainer is not five minutes lost from soft pedaling and stopping at lights, not two minutes lost from coasting down hills, it's zero minutes lost. Every pedal stroke is at the perfect power level. So. That's why I think it's good. The other, the other cool feature is you can program these workouts in different ways. I'm talking about programming with power. You can program it so that it, um, you know, the trainer will um, copy slope grades or you can even set it for heart rate, all that stuff. But here's the cool one. Just started using this. You can download a file from your ride. Say I go and do a hilly ride. I've downloaded that to Strava or your software of choice, Cycling Analytics. You can export the data file, which is usually in the GPX format. You can export that file into the tax or other trainer software, anyone that offers this feature. Go through and thinks about it. And that ride, the trainer will simulate exactly that terrain in the workout. So to give you an example, something I've added a feature for my clients this year is where I have a massive library of courses that I've written. I have the GPX file for all of them. If you have a smart trainer, I can upload that into your workout library. And if you want to train on the 
such and such course for Taupo, you're going to train North Island series, you're going to train for local road races, I can literally put you on that course to train on, on your indoor trainer. And here's a cool thing, I'm looking at it now, I'm doing it now, that's why I'm changing gears and stuff and I don't normally because it's going up and it's going down. I'm currently riding the Liverton Lower Hut time trial course and in the software it gives me uh, a little satellite image where I can zoom in and out of where I am on the course. I just tested it now, okay here we go. It, oh, I just tested it so on a part of the course, it must assume no wind or something, on a part of the course where I know, assuming no wind, flat, straight, for me, time trial position, CDA about 2.24, 320 watts is about 42 and a half kilometers per hour. Went to that part of the course on the trainer in the software, I can see where I am at the point of the course on the satellite map, pushed it up to 320 kilometers an hour, sorry, <laughs> I wish, 320 watts, and you guessed it, bang on the speed, so it's pretty cool, I mean it must be taking into account in its algorithm some factors around road surface and stuff, you know, it'll be assuming a road surface drag of 0 .0045 or something like that. And uh, I think it's pretty cool. So you can get uh, an idea. I mean, the benefit of all this is you can go and ride these courses, especially in a time trial, figure out what method for attacking that course and the parts of the course are ideal. Is it faster to attack that climb above VO2 max? pay for it on the descent, but the descent's, you know, strong enough that you can recover and doesn't feature time? I don't know, find out. Would you like to experiment going tempo up that hill but having strength to keep pushing over the other side? I don't know, find out. You can do it. You can check what your time would be with different tactics. So, that is the software. As I say, I use Text Neo. You can get different models. And they're kind of the features there's lots of sort of features and road feel features and I won't go into them but here's what you need. It, it basic just need any smart trainer with Bluetooth that has trainer software it's compatible with that you can use these features and that's it. And you might be paying I don't know 800 900 dollars for that at the bottom end or two and a half grand at the top end. Um, but I'm pretty wildly excited about the whole thing. There we go. I just finished the Liverton time trial course. There you go. I've been pedaling at an active recovery rate of about 160, 170 watts the whole time. Finished that course in uh, about 35, 36 minutes. At race pace, three laps, it's about 24, 25, 26 minutes. So you can see, pretty accurate. I'm happy about that. So. I did think of one extra super nerdy concept I'll leave you with. Imagine what you could do is you could take a GoPro of the course, you could play it on the TV in front of you at race pace and sit there on your trainer doing the course <laughs> while it rains outside, something like that. I think all these features are pretty cool. So that's what I'd say. So that is the, uh, my experience so far with the Chapter 2 Riri. Uh, and my kind of two cents on what you should think about and the cool features uh, of smart trainers when it's this time of year and it's freezing cold. As always, this is brought to you by Fid Lab, Tailwind Magician by Maximum Capital Cycles. If you would like a training plan from me, you can email me, steve at fitlab.co.nz or just go to fitlab.co.nz. I will be running a recon of the North Island series. Race one course this Sunday, meeting nine o'clock at whatever the cafe is in Featherston. If you'd like to come, come along, say hi. Uh, the more the merrier, the weather's bad. Don't come, because I won't be there. I'll report to you on the courses in the upcoming series. 
a team fit lab uh, for 2018 and the new fit lab team kit 2019 kit dropping about 12 weeks we'll be doing an order see you on the weekend guys